If anyone can give voice to the culture of the Monadnock region, it's Edie Clark. Many of you will probably know her best from her regular column in Yankee Magazine, Mary's Farm. What you may not know, though, is that she's a cons conservationist. Indeed, it was she, along with some others, who saved Mary's Farm in Harrisville. And she told me the story of this, and it, it, it reminded me a lot of what happens with land trusts from time to time. Uh, um, a group of people managed to get the farm, which was at risk of being lost after Mary died, um, off the market, thinking that they would find uh, an angel buyer to take ownership of it and uh, fix up the house and conserve the land forever. And um, when that angel didn't appear, they ended up doing it themselves. And so Mary ended up, or excuse me, Edie ended up owning the farm, and a neighbor conserved all the land with the Forest Society, and I suspect that she's never regretted it. <clears throat> you also may not know that she is an art lover and an avid art collector, and particularly of art created here in the Monadnock region. And she has particular expertise in how this region, uniquely and to our great benefit, has captivated and inspired artists as it has in the weeks leading up to today's exhibit, and for many, many years before. What a pleasure to speak on this subject, which is, as I prepared my remarks, I realized um, something that's very dear to my heart. I've never really spoken about this kind of thing before. Um, call it celebrating the art of this place. Well, I feel like before we can celebrate the art, we have to celebrate the place. And um, something I know that we can all agree on in this room is that we all love this place. It's why we're gathered here today, and it's why many of us do the things that we do. Why we paint, why we write, why we work so hard to put pieces of land into conservation. Because we love this place. But why do we love this place? What is it about the Monadnock region that we love so much? Is it just the hills and the trees and the farms and the lakes? Just the natural beauty here? When I first moved to the Monadnock region, that was about 40 years ago, I bought a little falling down cape set in a big stretch of woods. I didn't know much about it, but I had been recently divorced and was looking for something near my workplace that I could afford. That was hard to find. <laughs> this little cape filled the bill. It was for sale for $16,000. <laughs> it had an acre and a half of land, and I happen to think that a cape is the best house structure you can have in the New England climate. So I bought it. And since it was tiny, it didn't cost that much to renovate it. There was a rusted old pickup truck filled with uh, rescued metal pieces disintegrating into the earth behind the house, and it took me days and days to pick up all the trash that littered the perimeter. But I loved the peace of the woods that surrounded that house, and also the proximity to an undeveloped lake just at the end of the driveway. I didn't think I had any neighbors at first, but soon after I started working on the house, I discovered that I had a neighbor an older man who came to visit me frequently, sometimes on foot, sometimes in his old Dodge Dart. <laughs> he had lived on this land virtually all his life, and he had many stories to tell. And each time he came to visit, he told me a story, a story about the place where he was living, where I was now living. Thin layers of his narrative began to accumulate. He told me about a man named Edgar Seaver, who had once owned all this land, but who had died a few years earlier. His farm was legendary. There was so much acreage, no one seemed to know exactly how much there was. But it surrounded Silver Lake and encompassed, encompassed much of the land around my little cape. I was like a small island. The cape had also belonged to Edgar, but he had left this specifically to his niece, who had sold it to me. My friend told me that Edgar had named the house Bidewee, which is a Scottish term meaning stay a while. 
Edgar never lived in this house, but he rented it out, hence its name. So I was gradually learning about the place I had chosen to call home. I knew that many inhabitants had preceded me, most recently a bicycle mechanic. I knew that because there were bicycle parts strewn about the property when I first bought it. And I knew that someone had lived there, and that someone who had lived there was a capable drinker, as there were many gin bottles to be found <laughs> in the woods and around the stone walls. My neighbor told me that a family with six children had lived there too. It was such a tiny place. Where did they sleep? Oh, they stacked them up like cordwood at night. My <laughs> So that family of eight became part of my Bidoui legend. Now, I love stories. So I love to hear all this man had to tell me about the house and the hills and lakes around me, as well as about this man named Edgar Seaver. He was so thrifty. He used to add water to his milk at the end of the week before buying new. <laughs> he used rope to hold up his pants rather than buying a belt. He would throw his car into neutral and coast on interstate highways <laughs> in order to save gas. But after I discovered the extent of the land that he owned, it didn't take me very long to figure out that he was probably a multimillionaire. <laughs> At least in the value of the land that he owned. Only trouble was, he wouldn't sell anywhere. Not even an acre. Not that people hadn't tried to buy it. I guess there was a steady stream of offers coming in from every direction, but he wouldn't sell. My friend told me that Edgar would rather cut off his leg than sell any of his land. See, if he sold his land, he would have all the milk he wanted, and he could buy himself a belt, and he could not only drive a car without noticing the price of gas, he could even have a Cadillac. But why didn't he sell his land? Well. I don't actually know, because I never met the man. But from everything that's ever been told to me, and I have to add that I eventually learned that Edgar was a relation of my husband's family, so then I heard even more stories from them <laughs> once we made the connection to Uncle Edgar. But from all these stories about Edgar, I have to believe that he didn't sell his land because he loved it too much, because his farm had been in his family for generations. And he most likely couldn't imagine where he would go or who he would be if he had sold his land. Silver Lake Farm was a part of his being. It could probably have been found in his DNA. So as I listened to these stories and they piled up layer on layer and as I lived each year on that land and in that storied house, I came to understand my own passion for that particular place. It meant something to me. And it meant more to me than the beauty of the trees or the quiet of the lake with its summer looms and winter stillness. When you live on a place, you walk its paths, you learn its history, you paddle its waters, you listen to its stories, and you manage somehow to absorb the essence of that place into your very being. That is what I call love. So at the same time, I was also beginning to collect art. I've always loved art. I once dreamed of being an artist, but lacking talent. I took to admiring and purchasing the work of others. When I first met my second husband, I learned that his great uncle on the other side of the family um, had been a distinguished local artist. That artist's name was William Preston Phelps, or as the family called him, Uncle Preston. And to make it all the more personal, the great Phelps had lived and worked only a mile or so from where we were living. I thought it would be fun to find a painting by Uncle Preston to give to Paul for our wedding. No one in the family seemed to have one. So I searched around and found a small but brilliant painting of the Nanak in the fall. <clears throat> it hadn't cost very much, and though his name was known, it seemed that Phelps' paintings were hiding here and there. So I continued to search for more of his paintings. I was able to find many for reasonable prices. Over the years, I've probably owned several dozen of Uncle Preston's paintings, some of which I've sold or swapped for others. And in the process, I've also come into possession 
of the works of many other local artists, living or dead. We are fortunate to have so many talented artists who people our past and now our present. But what I've learned most specifically about Uncle Preston's work is that these are not only great works of art, but they are also historical documents of our landscape. Preston Phelps painted the scene pretty much as it was. He didn't move things around or make the mountain greater than it, was, than it appears in real life. He painted what he saw, often in great detail. So we have not only a catalog of the mountain at that time, he worked roughly from 1870 to the 1920s, but we have a study of the mountain from all angles and aspects under all different kinds of weather. He especially liked to paint during the winter. As he did on his farm, he worked his art outdoors, traveling around the mountain in a makeshift horse-drawn studio, which even inclu included a small stove for heat. He sometimes constructed rough structures to protect him from the elements while he worked. What he wanted was to find the mountain in all its moods, and we find, by looking at his turn of the 20th century paintings, that the face of the mountain has changed. For one thing, the trees are growing up and making the mountain greener every year. But even aside from that, we have here again a man who was in love with his place. William Preston Phelps was born on the family farm in Chesham in 1848. When in his teens, he was sent away from home to Lawrence, Massachusetts to learn to be a sign painter. His talent was recognized over and over, and eventually he was sent to Europe to study by a group of wealthy Lawrence businessmen. He went and he traveled throughout Europe, studying with the masters and finding a lifelong friend in Willard Metcalf. The two traveled extensively together. He came home and settled in Lawrence for a while, but the pull of Monadnock never left him and eventually he returned home to a family homestead in Chesham and painted the mountain obsessively for the rest of his life. It was home. It was what he loved. It was his place. I should add here that he, he had a very sad and tragic ending to his life, which involved uh, debt, and the reclamation of debt meant the auction off of his farm and his paintings. So he lost everything in the land. But even aside from that, we have here again a man who is in love with his place. William Preston. Oops. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> Another local. You never do an aside when you're doing a talk. <laughs> Very dangerous. <laughs> Another local artist who loved his place above all else was Abbott Thayer who ascribed to the mountain almost supernatural powers. Thayer was a native of Keene, but was drawn to Dublin, closer to the mountain. A wealthy patron built him a summer house there where he moved his family to live year-round. He shared his mountainside home not only with his large family, but with raccoons and squirrels, who sometimes slept indoors while the family famously slept outdoors, <laughs> summer and winter. Thayer was a world-class eccentric, but he was also a mesmerizing teacher who attracted artists of all kinds to Dublin, where they sat at his feet and became swept up in his passions. His passion for art as well his pa as his passion for the mountain. According to the writer and biographer Richard Merriman, who is the son of the great artist Richard Merriman, who also painted in Dublin and was one of their, theirs students. According to Richard Merriman, Thayer believed his art was dictation from God. <coughs> his mission was perfect beauty and Monadnock was totem. Aside from his powerful mystical paintings of angels and of the mountain, Thayer is well known as the designer of camouflage, now used by virtually every soldier on earth. He is lesser known as, the early, as an early conservationist. His foresighted and strident efforts to save Mount Monadnock from development started a movement that has now succeeded in creating a mountain free of lights at night, free of cell towers at any time, 
or any structure whatsoever within a goodly distance of its circumference. As a result of Thayer's and many others' efforts, Monadnock is to this day still a mountain well worth painting. For that alone, he should be celebrated. However, it is for his art and his force of nature personality that he is best remembered. At one time, folks thought that the only reason artists came to this area was because of the magnetic personality of Abbot Thayer. But Abbot Thayer died in 1921, and William Preston Phelps, who also brought a number of art students to his Chesham studio, died in 1923. But artists continued to come, perhaps drawn by these legacies. Perhaps, as both men believed, it is the mysterious power of the mountain but artists still come to live and work in this region. The work of these artists, in many cases, is as important to our history as it is to our fine sense of beauty. Many of the artists whose work is on display today work in plein air. They work, like Thayer and Phelps, in the open air. I'm fortunate enough to know a few of these artists, and I know that, in the case of Dave Dodge and Mary Islin, they have endured more than slight discomfort in pursuit of the image they want to capture. Why do we love these paintings, such as those that are on display today? Why do we want to own them? Because we want to somehow capture, it, capture and keep the beauty that surrounds us. We want to bring that beauty indoors and keep it. We also feel a sense of gratitude for what we have here and we all feel the specialness of this place. In this way, these artists are conservationists, as every painting that is created of the beauty that surrounds us is, in a way, conserving that place, that seems an uncommonly generous thing to do. We also owe a great debt of gratitude to the unique and unforgettable individuals, such as Edgar Seaver and my former neighbor, Paul Bettis, for being so irascible and stubborn, refusing to sell their land no matter the price, even before it was popular to talk about conservation. We owe them that debt especially because they really couldn't afford to say no to these offers. Now, I was hoping Paul would be here today, but I see that he's not. So I want to tell a story on him. <laughs> I have about a million. Um, I'm like him when I first knew him. I can tell you all kinds of stories. But we used to um, sometimes get together for dinner in the winter. Paul had a little trailer over on Silver Lake. I don't know how he endured it, but he would sleep there even in the coldest of nights. He was like, have it there. So the deal was I would drive him home after dinner. And it was a very cold night. Icy, you know, it was one of those times when the snow cover had turned to ice. And um, I got him to where the path led down the trail. It was very steep. So he said, now, if you just sit here, roll down your window, sit here, and, and wait for me to say, OK. So I said, OK. Um, and then I said, Paul, how do you get down there? It's very slippery. It's very icy. He said, oh, I have a rope. He said, I call it my assisted living. <laughs> God bless him. Um, a lot of that land I'm talking, we're talking about is now in conservation in various places. So um, it's passion. It's not always about money. Sometimes it's about money, but it's passion a lot of times. Um, these people have saved these precious resources for us, whether they knew it or not. It's our place. We love it, and we want to keep it as it is, whether on canvas or by easement. Much has happened in this place since the great masters were painting the mountain in the 19th century. Much is still possible because we all share a certain kind of love, also known as community, which gives us a unique quality of life for which I, for one, am extremely grateful. Thank you very much.